In this talk, I'm going to discuss understandings of kink within psychology, psychiatry, and psychotherapy, uh, particularly the historical tendency to treat kink practices and identities as pathology. So I'll explore a critique of this pathologizing stance in the context of recent changes to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. I hope I don't have to say Diagnostical and Statistical Manual very often. I'll just say DSM. Um, that manual of the American Psychiatric Association and the World Health Organization International Classification of Diseases, the two major psychiatric diagnostic manuals used in contemporary practice in the West at least. I'll then discuss the tensions inherent in community uses of the language of therapy. This is my little bit that I've thrown at the end. It's effectively a continuation of a discussion that MJ and I, had, I have had over many years, um, particularly when, it, when these uh, communities draw on theories of psychopathology. In other words, I'll explore the potential perversity of communities employing the language of psychopathology just at the point we are managing to persuade the psy professions to stop thinking of kink and our worlds as pathology and perversion. So, okay, so, ah, just a quick note on terminology. Um, I'm using the term kink bigger than it's usually used just to stop me doing kind of multiple complicated kind of clauses. So I'm using kink to include all BDSM, so that's bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism, strict sadomasochism, along with the fetishes. Okay, so I'm just going to use kink as an all-inclusive term just for the sake of ease. And I'm also only talking about acts between uh, consenting adults. I'm not going anywhere near anything else. Okay, so to start with a little bit about the roots of pathology and perversion in the psi professions. So the notion of perversion, which is now mostly reframed within psychology and psychiatry as paraphilia, has remained pretty much unchanged since its early use by the medical and legal professions during the late 19th century. So the term um, to pervert comes from the Latin pervertere, which literally means to turn around or turn upside down. So this is not to describe an opposite or statistically rare instance but rather a deviation deemed inappropriate to the normal aim of some behavioural domain. For instance, if we're interested in human food choice, which I am, then it will be considered to be perverted only if someone likes... Uh, it's not considered to be perverted if you like something that's culturally unusual. So eating caviar would not generally be thought a perversion, but eating faeces would be. It's something that's culturally prescribed rather than culturally unusual, which is, in a sense, the root of the term perversion. The difficulty, of course, is in drawing the line between normal, rare, but culturally acceptable choices and abnormal, perverted behaviours, especially as these vary across culture and change over time. For instance, with food, is it acceptable to eat raw puffin heart? Cheese rotten with maggots? A dog? For some people, the answer is clearly yes, whilst things, other things uh, like that would be objectionable to others. The application of the notion of perversion to human sexuality occurred during the mid-19th century in France and Germany. Sexology was developing within medicine as an important new domain of study, and key to it was the idea that the essential aim of human sexuality was reproduction and the preservation of the species. And this idea remains pervasive to today, in spite of the enormous cultural and technological change, things like feminism, contraception, etc. Effectively, that fundamental link between sex and reproduction remains intact in much of our culture in the West, at least. So this work was uh, at the root of the early French work that influenced a generation of sexuality scholars on the continent, notably including Richard von Kraft Ebbin. Kraft Ebbin wrote the highly influential work Psychopathia Sexualis, with it first published in 1886, but updated thereafter to about the 12th ed edition, I think. The title was written in Latin, like a number of sections of the book, which I always, always amuses me, this. I just, it, it's worth repeating, even though you probably all know it, but it, it makes me laugh. The title was written in Latin, like a number of other sections of the book, in order to keep it out of the hands of the layman. For, for fear it may corrupt. Um, this was a text for the medical profession and their perversions only. Um, Kraft Ebbing further inscribed a particular structure for understanding diversity in sexual practice and sexuality through his somewhat notorious fourfold classification. And even this kind of has resonances in contemporary sexology and psychiatry. The categories were sexual anesthesia, in which there's a lessening or complete absence of sexual desire, hyperesthesia, an excessive increase in sexual desire, paradoxia, sexual desire outside the normal developmental period. So this one seems a bit odd. It's, it's effectively sexually precocious children or the granny or grandpa that are at it like a bunny, and people don't think they should be, um, or at least Kraft Ebbing didn't. Um, and paresthesia, which is where the sexual instinct deviates from the natural aim of reproduction. So this is the perversions, in other words. Now, as I'm sure you've probably already spotted, 
The challenge comes with that latter diagnostic category, you know, whether we like the rest or not, um, because it kind of includes rather a lot, and it includes all sexual acts that deviate from the reproductive norm. Now, even, um, even Dirob Richards spotted that this was a problem, um, because it was too all-encompassing. Pretty much, you know, everyone was at perverted behaviour. So the sexological community of the time needed to depathologize the casual experimenter from what Danny Nobus re refers to as the true blue pervert, the appellation controlé of the world of perversion. <laughs> he deserves credit for that. Um, the key means was to define the pervert as the person whose sexual desire permanently deviates from the sexual norm. So a casual interest in experimentation with a perversion like bondage or leather will well be fine within the context of an otherwise reproductively appropriate heterosexual relationship. <laughs> but God help you if you like it just that bit too much <laughs> or don't care much for reproductively oriented sex and so on. So the distinction between normal and abnormal perverts is also undoubtedly present in contemporary therapeutic discourse today. This isn't just an exercise in history. These things kind of have marked the discipline that we inhabit and mark our practice today, as well as our culture and wider social worlds that we inhabit. Whether we like to admit it or not, we see this in all sorts of aspects of life today. For instance, the contemporary rise in the therapeutic discourse of addiction so often results in any deviation from, from the norm being labelled as pathological. And this includes sexuality. I personally encounter far too many people diagnosed with addiction problems coming to see me in a last-ditch attempt to find someone who does not think their kink is part of a broader addiction pathology. I think there's a lot of worrying stuff going on around the growth of uh, addiction within the context of sex and sexuality. The work of Kraft Ebbing and his sexological contemporaries was, of course, highly influential on dear old Sigmund Freud, and Freud's work on sexuality is now canonical within the psy professions. And also particularly interesting in the context of this talk for how it posed another challenge, which was kind of sidestepped, to cultural understandings of the sexual instinct. Because Freud also adopted the distinction between normal and abnormal perversion, in spite of the fact that this distinction, medically speaking, in term, doesn't work in terms of his own theory. Freud's theory of sexual development, in which the sexual drive is not intrinsically driven towards reproduction, was instead part of a polymorphously perverse disposition provides a radical challenge to those sexological understandings that link sex with reproduction. So, if Freudian thinking is taken to its logical conclusion, the key developmental question uh, is not what causes perversions to arise, but instead what causes reproductively focused sexuality to appear. In the words of Danny Nobis again, normality, if such a thing exists, is always a deviation from perversion. This logical conclusion was, sadly, not followed. Um, and instead, Freud and his many followers deployed a notion of normal sexual development that was very much within the context of, context of his Victorian morality. And he and those that followed him have sadly not been concerned with identifying, the, identi have sadly been concerned with identifying the causes of perversion and not of normality. Now, of course, psychoanalysis is the master trope when it comes to the talking therapies. And whilst the diagnostic manuals for psychological disorders have ostensibly moved away from psychoanalysis in a bid to claim some sense of medical neutrality, it was central in the early formation of these tools in determining what is and what is not a psychological disorder. This is even truer when it comes to understanding the relationship between psychology, psychiatry and kink, a contemporary battleground where the notion of medical neutrality within the diagnostic manuals is very much in doubt. Okay, so... I'm going to go on to um, kink as psychopathology. So in large part a result of this history, sexual sadism and masochism, along with a variety of other fetishes and otherwise harmless sexual proclivities, have been listed within the psychiatric nosologies of the American Psychiatric Association and the World Health Organization for many years. The consequences of psychiatric classification have been significant. Not only may individual kink practitioners encounter a pathologizing psychiatric and broader mental health profession, but the medical categorization also impacts on legislation and experiences of the legal system, as well as wider public understandings. The history is deeply troubling and at times distinctly harrowing. But things are changing for the better. I'm, gonna, I'm skipping over a very big history here, by the way. Um, but things, I have 30 minutes, bear with. Um, but things are changing for the better here with substantial progress regarding the status of kink within the latest edition of the International Classification of Diseases and, albeit to a lesser extent, also the American Psychiatric Association, DSM. There's a relatively positive tale to tell in this instance, but I'll argue that there's more to this narrative than meets the eye. 
as the power of a potentially damaging therapy ideology is pervasive and insinuating itself within communities in profound and I think at times in troubling ways. But first I'm going to outline the story of progress a little bit more and also focus a little bit more on DSM as there's been some explicit discussion in the scientific literature about some of the recent changes and some of the remaining tensions uh, that are there for, uh, for Kingsters. So the latest edition of DSM was published only a few years ago. This is version 5 now, following a long period of consultation about the diagnostic categories by the American Psychiatric Association Task Force. Task Force, I do. Oh, there. Um, sort of military operation it was. Uh, charged with rewriting this document. Uh, the APA claimed that DSM is and should continue to be neutral with respect to theories of etiology, rather than grounded in psychoanalysis. However, as Kleinplatz and Moser point out, this assumes that science can ever be value-free. During the process of construction of the new APA Diagnostic Manual, a number of organisations, academics and activists sought to petition the APA to have sexual sadism and masochism removed, since it was argued they do not meet the criteria for categorisation as a psychiatric disorder, for instance around distress and dysfunction, or where they do it is because of discrimination rather than individual pathology, much like homosexuality before and so on. These arguments and others from key clinicians in the field, along with the extraordinary campaigning efforts of uh, organisations like the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, had an impact. And DSM-5, which was published in 2013, no longer considered kink a disorder per se. That is, the diagnostic criteria were changed such that kink interests and activities are not, in and of themselves, sufficient to warrant a psychiatric diagnosis, which is a major change from the previous editions. Kink practices may still lead to a psychiatric diagnosis, but now only where there is distress and impairment beyond that expected through uh, prejudice. Now, Charles Moser and Pe Peggy Kleinplatz, two people I also want to thank right now publicly, um, have been key figures campaigning for change in DSM and also ICD. Their work together and alone has been instrumental in helping to effect this change, and they both deserve enormous credit and thanks from us all for work in the area. Shall we give them a little round of applause? They're not here, but they deserve it. They've done a tremendous job, and they're still continuing their, their great work. Um, Charles Moser has um, quite rightly raised some serious concerns about the current position with the DSM. It's not all, all kind of you know, good in the house of the American Psychiatric Association. And I suspect most of of course, are not psychiatrists here. So you may, I'm just doing an aside now, you may be thinking, why is he rattling on about the Psychiatric Association manuals? Because they inform our practice, whether we like it or not, they creep and insinuate themselves into the clinical kind of room all the time. They're not things we can escape, whether we like it or not. They're there within our culture, they're there within the legal system, they affect the lives of kinksters and clinicians alike. Um, okay, so Charles Moser has rightly raised a number of concerns, and I'm just going to kind of focus on one thing. The DSM, there's a lot of concerns, and I'm not going to go into all of them in, all, in detail. Um, he, he does that, a great job himself. But the DSM-5 contains a new definition of paraphilia, a curious beast to say the least. So paraphilia, so this is the APA definition of paraphilia. The term paraphilia denotes any intense and persistent sexual interest other than sexual interest in genital stimulation or preparatory fondling with phenotypic... <laughs> Wait for it, it gets better. <laughs> We haven't reached... Uh, anyway. Or preparatory fondling with phenotypically normal, physically mature, consenting human partners. Hmm. Now, as Charles Moser points out, I mean, he likes... To, I mean, he, he's writing in the scientific journal, so he has to be kind of measured here. As he points out, there is a lack of research that demonstrates this is a valid and reliable definition. <laughs> no shit, Sherlock. Um, <laughs> it's it, even a cursory demonstration kind of is worrying, to say the least. And it clearly kind of carries on some of those earlier sexological category distinctions that I touched on just a minute ago, in spite of the claims by the APA to only include diagnostic categories which are founded on a strong empirical research foundation. This clearly isn't. So we're left here, like Kraft Ebbing was in the 19th century, with a remarkably narrow array of sexual behaviours that are actually in the normal category. There's an awful lot that seems to fall under the definition of paraphilia and therefore subject to the, the scrutiny of the psychiatric profession and the broader side professions thereafter. Now, the APA sought to clarify this definition by stating that a paraphilic disorder would include, quote again, any sexual interest greater than or equal to normophilic sexual interests. Okay. 
As Charles Moser again points out, this remains problematic, even in the APA's own terms, as there is no standard for how to measure the strength of para or normo philic interests. And indeed, most people with paraphilic interests also have normophilic interests. So the APA tried again. So they've tried again to clarify a little bit further. So again, quotes. So they've, a paraphilia implies interest in these activities that equals or exceeds the person's interest in copulation or equivalent interaction with another person. <laughs> so, still as clear as mud, I'm afraid. Um, the curious thing is what this equivalent interaction means, what's not equivalent, and why. What we see here, and indeed throughout the DSM categorization of the paraphilias, is a set of pretended diagnostic categories and the association with the shitty... Oh, no, there I go. I was about to go and attack the Tory party. Mm, stop it. With a certain government introducing <laughs> pretended families um, is meaningful and meant. These are pretended diagnostic categories, and they carry no value, weight, and they should not be uh, in the DSM, and they should not be reigning, remaining there. They're driven primarily by moral concerns rather than empirical research or even consistent logic. Any notion of neutrality here is clearly nonsense. Charles Moser, he's, he's, he's been on a roll, has also been very recently raising a number of important questions for the creators of the ICD manual as well. So here things were slight, somewhat more positive than the DSM, even accepting that things have improved with DSM. The latest version of ICD, now version 11, um, has taken um, out a number of these, um, these aspects of the kink world. So now we've only got, we've got, okay, removed from them is fetishism, fetishistic transvestism, and sadomasochism. So they're all removed from the manual. And they were removed on the grounds that they're inconsistent with human rights principles. So this is interesting because this is clearly an explicit acknowledgement by the World Health Organization that the categories were driven by versions of morality rather than more traditional empirical psychiatric reasons, whether we agree with them or not as clinicians. So ICD-11 still includes exhibitionism, frotterism, paedophilia and voyeurism as mental disorders. Um, they've also suggested, and, and this is particularly worrying, adding in a number of others. These include, bear with, coercive sexual sadism disorder, other paraphilic disorder involving non-consenting individuals, and finally, paraphilic disorder involving solitary behaviour or consenting individuals. So all, except the last one, involve non-consenting individuals. Now, there have been many arguments in the literature about the conflation of criminal behaviours with mental illness and how that is problematic. And there's a very strong argument that we should not be uh, running those two things together. But that's not my focus in this talk here today. But the worry that Charles Moser rightly points out is that this last definition, which is about consensual behaviour, could very easily encompass things like consensual sadomasochism. So... Even though there's been a great deal of improvement with ICD, we'll have to see what unfolds. Like so much about progress around sexual and gender diversity, the battle is never won. There's always resistance and continuing fights and battles to be had. We must never be complacent, actually, as, as therapists, academics, clinicians, whatever we are, just as human beings, um, because actually the world can get worse. It doesn't just automatically get better the sort of enlightenment model of progress that is the heart, I think, of a lot of beliefs that actually things will just improve is a little naive, I think, actually. And look around the world at the moment, and whilst there is progress in lots and lots of places and lots of ways, equally we see backlashes and resistance and deeply disturbing things going on, especially around sexual and gender diversity. <laughs> so, anyway, regardless of these remaining problems and the warning notes, the breakthrough in declassifying kinkus pathology per se in its own right is undoubtedly important. And there's already emerging evidence that these changes are making a difference to people's lives, which is the most important thing here. The National Coalition for Sexual Freedom in the USA report that there's been a substantial drop in the number of people having their children removed from them on the basis of their sexual preferences. The number of discrimination cases has dropped from 600 in 2002 to 500 in 2010, and then following the change to DSM to around 200 in 2015. So it appears changes to the diagnostic manuals have had a profound impact on the lives of kink practitioners already in the USA and very likely elsewhere in the world. So undoubtedly a story of progress in which one line of resistance to sexual freedom and equality has been pushed back. There remains some way to go with kink and in medical professions. Firstly, of course, it'll take some time for the psychiatric manuals to change practice, 
there's a lot of recalcitrant practitioners out there. And there may also be resistance, of course, along the way. The proposed diagnostic categories are testament to that. Second, psychiatric and psychotherapeutic training courses are generally and frequently very poor when it comes to sexual and indeed gender diversity issues, as Dominic and MJ have shown in their work. There will often be just one or two se sessions on LGBT issues, maybe not even that, with rarely anything on sexual and gender diversity more broadly. So as I mentioned earlier, as a specialist working therapeutically in the field myself, I see far too many clients who have had their interest in kink categorised as pathology by other therapists. Um, and most often these days, as I said, as a form of sexual addiction. Um, okay. The final reason I want to kind of think about um, the narrative of uh, pathology and therapy with regard to kink is about the way that it's actually also being appropriated within kink communities. Now, this has been ongoing for some time, but I do think there's a, there's a growth, actually, in the narrative of uh, therapy within kink communities. Effectively, a therapeutic narrative has become internalised in quite a strong way now, I think. And whilst it can undoubtedly be used positively by people as a way of reclaiming control over their own mental health and well-being, I do actually believe it also carries some risk, at least at the level of the broader political um, sphere. So I'll turn my attention now to the growth of this new sexual story and explore and raise some possible tensions that perhaps we can discuss further collectively. So... In many ways, there's kind of like good evidence that actually there's been a noticeable rise in the telling of a narrative of kink as psychologically therapeutic. This is a somewhat different narrative to the narratives of kink as a means of achieving transcendence or some sense of spiritual engagement. This is specifically about using the language of conventional therapy, if you like, rather than language of uh, health, well-being, spirituality, and so forth. And this narrative is the one that I believe is actually growing, potentially at the expense of some of those other narratives, and that's part of my concern. It frequently involves some notion of kink being healing and a journey from mental illness to psychological health, Oops. Um, as you see in things like the film Secretary and various other kind of contemporary cultural phenomena. Central to, the, to many of these stories are accounts of how people use kink to take control over their bodies um, or otherwise rework past trauma. Scenes are created and worked through in order to process some troubling aspect of selfhood. And we see people engaging in kink to release pent-up emotions that would otherwise overwhelm, to atone for past wrongdoings, or to be released from the responsibilities of contemporary life. So what's the harm? Why are these community tales of health and well-being through sexual practice problematic? Well, first, kink has obviously historically been associated with trauma and abuse within the medical profession. The sexologists I was referring to very much understand it in those terms. And this is in spite of empirical evidence suggesting that this is an incorrect assumption. There isn't actually evidence that people who engage in kink have suffered abuse more than anyone else and are reenacting it later in life as a consequence. So there's obviously a psychoanalytic root to this story, and it's pervasive, with people outside and within kink communities adopting the story with often quite troubling consequences. It's been argued that the use of therapeutic narratives can seen as an attempt to wrest the story of pathology from the medical profession, to radically rework it and take ownership of it. That is, by deploying the narrative of healing through kink, we deny the medical profession control of our bodies and instead forge a non-medical alternative for thinking through our mental health and well-being. The narrative of therapy is therefore not only a way of phenomenologically describing the experience of kink, but also a political rejection of the increasing biomedicalization of our bodies. I can't argue with that. That's, that's a positive thing for me. And it's radical, too. But I continue to fear that the negatives may weigh, outweigh the positives and also, with the change that I've just talked about in the diagnostic manuals, it could potentially become an almost perverse uh, outcome where communities embrace the language of psychopathology when the medical profession are finally moving away from it. The use of a narrative that implies people engaging in kink need healing, combined with the increasingly hegemonic nature of the therapeutic, that it, you know, as in dominating nature of the therapeutic narrative, I fear risk reinscribing pathology within the community, whilst also risking shutting down other voices. The voices, for instance, of transcendent spirituality, etc., that have been present in the kink community for all eternity. So whilst we might want to welcome people articulating their experience in whatever manner makes most sense to them, I would never argue against that, it carries political consequences beyond a particular individual 
and their experiential process. Danielle Lindemann's analysis of professional dominatrices in New York and San Francisco helps think through a few of these things a little bit further. Her participants clearly used the language of therapy to make sense of their work. In the study of 66 female pro-doms, the participants described their work as an alternative to repression, a mechanism for atonement, a device for confronting past tra trauma, and a psychological reprieve from the pressures of postmodern life. They argue that the essence of what they do is to offer a safe and non-judgmental space in which their clients can work through their needs, in which kink activities are construed as psychologically healthy. This is obviously in direct opposition to the traditional, now changing psychiatric, psychiatric discourse of kink as inherently patho pathological. But the stories of these prodoms are complex. For instance, there's examples of prodoms, prodoms in this study drawing on the language of pathology underpinning a client's need, and therefore risking reinforcing rather than undermining the link between pathology and kink. There's also talk of kink practices as recuperative, invoking a notion of cure, and therefore some end point, resonant again with the notion of pathology, but not necessarily a returning client engaged in a consensual sexual relationship. The shift in narrating this work as therapy rather than sex work also speaks to another issue. A number of these women appear to want to distance themselves from the more stigmatised notion of sex workers and instead embrace the more acceptable notion of being mental health practitioners. And this is understandable, of course, within the context of you know, disproportionate power afforded to different categories of work. And the canonical narrative of therapy is, of course, laden with power and privilege. And this is undoubtedly seductive, but it's something that we should be alert to. The stories we tell, um, in a sense, matter. They actually help to structure and frame the way that we live in the world and understand ourselves and others. Um, but stories kind of carry with them sort of certain consequences, and they can open up and shut down experience, um, you know, equally and with equal kind of benefit and risk. Um, in many ways, the, th the key here is how we must think critically about the lines of power that operate through particular stories and whether they are such that they will become hegemonic and therefore shut down other possibilities, and also carry with them consequences that we may not have thought through fully, political ones as well as personal ones. So not only does a therapeutic narrative carry connotations of pathology and the need for healing, but it also potentially desexualizes kink practice. Kink in these terms may no longer become a pleasurable sexual pursuit, a form of serious leisure, if you will, which is a term from a variety of uh, sociological writers, but is instead at risk of becoming another desexualized part of what's been termed the reflexive project of self, a term from Anthony Giddens. Um, effectively, the project of, that is growing within contemporary society of us making ourselves a better human being, a very individual, kind of capitalist, consumerist model of humanity, actually, as a way of coping with personal vulnerability and uncertainty in these risky and confusing times. So to conclude... I hope I've provided a little bit of useful information about the treatment of kink within the side disciplines, past and present, along with the criticism that has affected some substantial change in recent years by some colleagues of ours that have done tremendous work. It's been a troubling history involving much abuse towards our minority community, but sadly there remain many problems today still in the UK and elsewhere around the world. There's undoubtedly been progress, but a long way remains to go. Two key take-home messages, I guess, though, kind of broadening out a little bit from the, the narrow focus. I think the first thing I'd like to say is I'd like us to recognise the way that the therapeutic space is inflected by the political and that power operates through us in curious ways. We need to be particularly alert to it, even when it might appear on the surface to be operating for the good. The growing therapeutic culture that we inhabit here in the UK and elsewhere in the West particularly has demonstrated positive potential. For instance, the stigma of mental illness is being challenged in incredibly valuable ways. That's to be welcomed. Even so, this does not mean that the growth of a therapeutic culture is all to the good. Things can be both good and bad at the same time. I, th I think the years of Kleinian analysis helped there. Um, we must avoid polarised positions in spite of this becoming increasingly the, nor the norm in our political discourse. As I pointed out, people within sexual communities embracing the language of therapy can clearly find benefits from this. But there are also risks and potentially problems in the longer run at the broader socio-cultural and political levels. It seems particularly paradoxical to me that just as we see progress in removing the, the iron grip of pathology from um, the medical side professions, that kinksters will choose to embrace this very same language within our communities. The worry is not about a small number of individuals making sense of their experience through the language of therapy. Not at all. 
My concern is more, rather more focused on the dang dangers of the language of therapy becoming hegemonic, such that it becomes the dominant way to frame a person's understanding of their sexual self. And as people enter communities, of course, it then becomes the only way to frame our understanding of ourselves. I think the difficulty of holding on to multiple, often oppositional positions, such as embracing a therapeutic discourse alongside the others, occurs when one of these positions is culturally much more powerful than the others. It isn't an even playing field. If you have a culturally powerful discourse where the wider culture actually is supporting it and, and encouraging it, it's much harder then to sustain competing stories of selfhood at the very same time. They often get subsumed within this dominant discourse as it consumes our culture. My second take-home point is I hope my quick trawl through the history of sexology better alerts us to the way that morality plays a central role in the creation of categories of pathology. The dividing line concerning perversion is not so clear-cut, no matter what the side professions may claim. For me, the critical issue is that we identify where ethics and morality are used to claim space in determining what behaviours are acceptable or not, and who is or is not psychologically healthy, whether this is openly acknowledged or dressed up in the language of academic or clinical neutrality. Shining a light on these moments, as people like Charles Moser and Peggy Kleinplatz have done in their critical work, they provide a challenge to those making determinations about who and what is healthy or not. But this is not just an exercise in history or even theory, even though both are valuable. As therapists ourselves, it is vital that we raise questions about our own position in our own practice in the very same manner. The notion of therapeutic neutrality, for instance, is deployed frequently by the jobbing counsellor and psychotherapist as much as it is by the sexologists and psychiatrists. In those moments where we claim neutrality, we risk the projection of our own worldview onto our clients as we fail to encounter them in their glorious complexity, diversity and difference. We are not and can never be truly neutral in the world, nor should we want to be. We are thrown into a world that predates us and ultimately frames the way that we understand it, including our own, often very personal and powerful understandings of sex, sexuality and gender. Our role as therapists is not to deny this material, not to pretend we do not have these thoughts and feelings, but is instead, I believe, argue here, to place the historical and con cultural conditions of our own creation as therapists centre stage in our professional development and practice. This is what pink therapy for me is all about. It's our duty to understand the limitations of our own worldview and strive to meet our clients in their difference with care and compassion. And that's enough for me. Thank you.